in India, we express our gratitude to our respected guests. Thank you. So we just bow our head to you, all of you, and we welcome you. Thank you. This is style we also adopt in Japan. But it has gone from India to Japan, as Buddhism has gone from India to Japan and several other countries. So we have with us, you know, the whole team of IP. We have the registrar, we have admin head, and we have other people. So maybe each one of them will talk with. But to start with, I want my um, director, Professor Arke Mishra, to speak to you. OK, friends, I think uh, before they talk about themselves, let me talk a bit about them, and uh, you have seen on my left is Dr. P. Gita, a highly acclaimed colleague who has several degrees besides her PhD, has published prolifically. She runs a journal. She has been to almost all parts of the world, and uh, she has been a consultant to many national and international organizations. Much of what you see today that has come from her. And uh, she's a very active mind, very, very cooperative. And I'm very sure that she'll make your stay of three weeks very, very comfortable. And uh, at the end, we'll be very eagerly looking forward to listen from you that you came from home away to this new home. So when you go back, you'll always remain in India as your second home. Please also cooperate with us and tell us what more we can do for you so that you can be happy and we can make uh, the course successful in terms of our objectives. I think that I think it is the central purpose. Uh, on my right, she's always right. We have Professor Kiran there. She again holds several degrees. I am the least educated person. Uh, she, holds <laughs> she holds several degrees. Uh, she is head of the Center on Corporate Governance, which is run by the Government of India. She has drafted the Corporate Governance provisions of the Companies Act 2013 of uh, the Indian uh, Government. Uh, she also is the editor of an international journal on Corporate Governance. She is registrar of the Institute, so you can understand everything that we do that gets registered with her. She's very cooperative, I can tell her, on her face, and I'm very sure that uh, you'll be happy to ask for anything that you require from the Institute to uh, uh, Ms. Kiran. She's also uh, in charge, co coordinator of a two-year MBA program, an MBA program in banking, insurance, and finance, which is a very, very important sector, upcoming sector. Uh, in India. Then we have Professor Murthy. Uh, he is the top boss of the institute. He is the dean here and he is uh, head of all academic activities. He oversees six MBA programs at the institute. He also oversees uh, the research division of the institute. He has taught in all the four premier institutes of management, uh, management in India and uh, he has guided several, several uh, PhDs. Then we have Professor Satish. Professor Satish is our coordinator of management development training. Of this, this training program is a part. He runs about 70 programs. We have trained about 50,000 managers and 3,000 top civil service personnel of the government of India and of the state governments. Uh, we have such we have had such 25 to 30 programs in India and abroad, and we have done those programs with the Prime Minister's Secretariat and the Cabinet Secretariat of India, and many programs have been done in UK, US, Russia, China, and many other countries. Uh, he holds uh, a master's degree from a premier management institute of India. Uh, he's a very different type of person. He has worked in public sector, he has worked in private sector, and he has run the businesses on his own. So that makes him totally different from, I think, all of us. Then we have there uh, Mr. Fani. He's the finance and uh, accounts chief of this institute. And you can understand, we just can't stand without his support. Because uh, finance is the blood, you know, uh, life, you know, for, for, for any individual. Uh, all that you see in terms of facilities at the institute, they come from him. 
He's a very generous person, and therefore, if you'd like to have any, you know, support, you'll find Mr. Funny coming forward and helping you. Uh, he's present on the campus all the 24 hours, even if he's away at home, because uh, your program is something which is very, very important. He attaches a great importance to your program. And then we have here Dr. Sai Shelja. She's a prolific researcher at the Institute. Dr. Sai Shelja has done specialization in energy economics. I understand that one of you also is working in the area of energy. Uh, we had the big conference, and big conference, IP organized the public enterprise part, and we have the Bureau of Public Enterprises of South Africa coming here. In fact, let me tell you, Bureau of South uh, Enterprises uh, of South Africa was set up with the help of the Institute of Public Enterprise way back. Mr. Mabiki and I, we have worked together. Mr. Mabiki has come to our institute, and I am on the board of several South African universities. I uh, do what is known as APMR, Peer Mechanism Review. I am a part of the Peer Mechanism Review for all the universities, especially uh, the, the School of uh, uh, Public Administration and Governance in uh, Pretoria University. I work with them. I've been to several other parts of uh, Africa too. Uh, when I say that, let me have the pleasure of saying that one of my friends was Prime Minister and President of Tanzania also. Uh, it was 1967 that uh, we had the ambassador of Tanzania to India and his brother-in-law was in my university that was 1967. He passed out, and then he went to Tanzania. He became head of the Burma Shell. Then he became, I think, a minister. Then he became, I understand, a prime minister. Then he became president, and then he also was ambassador of Tanzania to US and Japan. This is how Tanzania has been very, very close to us. Some of my friends, they teach in Tanzania, especially the university. Uh, there is an institute of small uh, scale enterprises. Uh, they, they, work, uh, they, they work there. Uh, then, Dr. Sai Shelja is head of our admissions, and she uh, she is the person who looks after admissions to all our management programs at the postgraduate level. We have seven management programs, and this year, Government of India has allowed the institute to admit foreign nationals and also ch children of. Uh, uh, of uh, those people who are from the Indian origin and who are on the PIO persons of Indian origin card. So we take this opportunity to publicize our programs. She will be in touch with you. The window has just opened and we look forward to have as many people from Africa as we can. And uh, you have all the assistance of the Africa Development Fund. I am a part of that. You can get assistance you know, from that. You can assist, get assistance for your wards from the Commonwealth Secretary London, they also have got an Africa fund. So money is not a problem. I would request all of you to send your words to this institute for their postgraduate studies. We also have a PhD program with 10 universities in India, and we offer PhD in management, commerce, public administration, economics, psychology, sociology. These are the areas in which we offer uh, you know, our PhDs. We have Dr. Vidyarthi there. Dr. Vidyarthi is a PhD from the National Institute and he's an expert in the area of finance, especially capital markets. So all of you who have capital, you can consent and I request him to give free consultancy to all of you. He also advises many sovereign funds and man, much of your flows from uh, mutual funds, they come uh, to these sovereign funds. You can always take, uh, you can always take his advice. And there uh, we have uh, Dr. Mantha, Dr. Mantha is uh, the former chairman, come managing director of one of the largest public sector defense company in India. We had a president, and his name was former president. His name was um, Dr. Kalam. Dr. Kalam developed a special uh, ballistic uh, missile regime. And as per that ballistic missile regime, we can target any country from India to anywhere in the world sitting here. We can target New York. We can go to any part of the world. So uh, he is the person who has done all that, that large, very large company of defense that is in Hyderabad. And he was the CMD. He's one of the very senior uh, public sector personnel. And he's our professor on industry, 
and IPE liaison. How these two can come together? We have been working in that area. There, we have Dr. Karuna. Dr. Karuna is head of two-year MBA program in marketing and retailing. She has three MAs and two PhDs. She also publishes a journal, uh, New Marketing Vista, and she is head of our placements. Uh, we have very good placements at the Institute. All those students who pass out, they get a job very well within India, and many of them have gone, uh, have gone abroad. And there we have Dr. Tiwari. Dr. Tiwari is a professor of strategy and finance. He comes from a very reputed, uh, reputed management institute in India. We call it Indian Institute of Management Indoor. He has done his fellow program in management over there. And he's going to visit USA, uh, maybe I think next week or in a month, uh, where he'll participate in the American uh, Management uh, Congress. And there we have Professor Menon, one of our senior most colleagues. He was dean in the fourth largest university of India, uh, which is there about 30 kilometers away. We have our campus there too. We'll take you, I think, one of these to Spana University. Uh, that university is, uh, is, you know, set up on a 3,000 acre campus that has 500,000 plants. And once you go there, you extend your life for, by a few days. I'm very sure when you go back, you'll have at least added a few months to your life, and you live, you know, you live longer. Dr. Menon is a professor of accounting, finance, and strategy. He'll speak to you on the strategic management, and I think that will be something very great music uh, for you to hear him. And there we have Professor Tivikram, who's head of our economics area, and his specialization uh, is on economics of education. He's head of our publications division. He publishes six journals. Uh, we have brought out about 250 books from national and international publishers. We have six journals in the institute, and all of them are accredited journals. Two of them are published by international publishers. And our publishers include Springer, Elsevier, Blackwell, uh, Greenleaf. Uh, uh, you know, you think of any big publisher. And uh, we have made them big, and they made big us. So we work with them, and I think all, almost all my co colleagues, they are highly cited. Uh, they have a very high citation ratio, and uh, their research and consultancy is considered to be of very, very high quality. And then we have our professor, Deep Chandra. Dr. Deep Chandra is a professor of human resource management. She specializes on public enterprise management. She has published prolifically, and she is also warden of the institute. So uh, I hope in the, you can always see Dr. Chandra, uh, Dr. Chandra on the campus. Then next to Dr. Chandra is Professor Shaheen. Professor Shaheen is an engineer uh, uh, by profession. Uh, she has done her PhD. She is a quantitative techniques person. And there is a new branch of uh, mathematics and statistics developing all over the world today uh, that is known as analytics. And she specializes in the area of analytics, big data and deep data, and that will be of very, very great interest to all of you. And I think at the end, if you can set up an understanding of having some big data together uh, between Africa and India, I think that will be the best outcome, I'm sure, of this program. And next to her is Dr. Shilugna Sarkar, She's head of our corporate social responsibility division. And many of you have been involved in that area. And some of you will do your project work too, I think in that area on corporate governance, maybe I think on, on, uh, on CSR, and I think Dr. Gita will explain to you. We have given some thought to it. Uh, Dr. Sarkar uh, is also head of our two-year MBA program. on human resource development. And there, she has brought many, many new innovative elements like HR metrics, like HR analytics, motivation, leadership, international HR management, several things. And she also publishes journal. Uh, uh, she is a highly you know, rated you know, author. So this is all I think about our colleagues. And I, we have Dr. Janki there. Dr. Janki is our professor of uh, environment and climate management. This institute is one among top 100 think tanks in the world in the area of environment. She has done 500 projects for the government of Netherlands on different areas of biotechnologies. She's also our head of uh, uh, relations with the all regulatory bodies 
in India, and she also looks after the work of uh, accreditation. Uh, Dr. Uh, Janki has published uh, papers in national and uh, international journals very, very prolifically. And there we have Dr. Lakshmi. Dr. Lakshmi is the head of her knowledge center. When you go down in the library, she's the most richest person. Lakshmi in India. Lakshmi means goddess of wealth. But in India, there is always a conflict between goddess of wealth and goddess of knowledge. But here you find not a conflict but convergence. In the sense that she is very rich, at the same time she also had the knowledge center, which is very, very rare. Now she will speak more about knowledge center, but this is the only institute where World Bank, IMF, United Nations, any government body, if they have to do anything, which is of global nature in the public sector, they have to come to IPE. Uh, we have very, very rare reports. Uh, we have all the databases here. You can get connected to three, 5,000 journals here. Uh, you can uh, do everything within the library, and you have access of those things in your uh, room uh, where you are staying. Uh, I think it's a very, very rich library. We have created the library over a period of you know 50 years or so. And then next to her, is the Professor Pratna Kumar. She's again a PhD, a topper of MBA, and a PhD from a very uh, respected uh, university. She has published prolifically. She's also in charge of her uh, program, executive management program, which is open only to those executives who have put in three to five years of experience. So uh, she, um, she looks after that program. She has published uh, prolifically. She's also an expert in the area of startups, uh, entrepreneurship, social enterprises. So this is all I think about the Institute. I would not speak, I think, more than that, but I can only say we have Professor Anji Raju there. Professor Anji Raju uh, has taught in Oxford. Professor Anji Raju has been in several universities. He's an expert in the area of rural development, social enterprise, and uh, he looks after all the 1,000 students and 100 PhD scholars and 100 faculty members and the staff members at the institute. Uh, he is responsible for maintaining, maintaining discipline, for maintaining law and order uh, you know, at the institute. So this is all about the institute. About IP, I would only say one or two things. We are on the scenario scene for the last 55 to 60 years. We came before many management and uh, technology institutions. We are linked to all the ministries of the government of India. We evaluate the performance of 69 permanent secretaries, accepting defense, finance, uh, prime minister secretary, <coughs> and there is a planning body, Niti accepting these. And we'll show the book. And we had a big seminar uh, where 75 African countries had come, heads of the state. They had come, and your cabinet secretaries had come, uh, we had many other cabinet secretaries and prime ministers coming, and based on that, uh, we then put together the performance management systems in different countries you know, of the world. And we'd show, I think, I hope you get many more books here, and we'll keep on getting many more things also uh, when you go back. So we are set up primarily to help government of India to generate inputs on public policy relating to state-owned enterprises. But then, you know, the menu, you know, it got on expanding, and in 1974, Government of India wanted us to uh, undertake research, and therefore in 1974, IP was uh, recognized as a center for research in excellence. As a part of that, we undertake research for national and international organizations. We also have a PhD program. We have turned out about 85 PhDs, and Government of India has set up about 10 PhD scholarships at the institute. Uh, we also, as I told you, we also uh, uh, know, tackle our publications under research you know, and training. Then, further down, Government of India wanted us to do consulting for problem solving. So we have been doing that for government departments, for public enterprises, even I think for private enterprises, for local level institutions. You know, we have been doing that. And in 1996, Government of India wanted us to start uh, courses, not only in the evening, which we had started in 1981, for public sector personnel, but also in the day. And we started, you know, those courses in the day. Our board, as you would see, our board uh, is a board of eminent people. 
We are the former chief secretary of this state. In fact, we had two states and then there was a division. He was chief secretary of the composite state and I would read out his biodata. He was in the Reserve Bank of India, which is the top bank in the country. He's an activist, he's connected to rural development, he's connected to social transformation, economic transformation. He has the institute and we have very eminent scientists. Uh, in India, we have Indian Institute of Sciences, which is number 10th in the world, where scientific research takes place and president of that institute, who is also a Padma Bhushan, a public kind of recognition. We have Bharat Atna, that's the top recognition. The next one is Padma Bhushan. So he's a Padma Bhushan. Then we have a very uh, motivating person who leads a startup and entrepreneurship movement in India. His name is Mr. M.D. Pai. He's also on the board of the institute. And in commercial banks, in 1934, we have set up the State Bank of India, which is the top commercial bank in the country. And many other sub banks are getting merged into that. And uh, the CGM of that bank after retirement. Uh, she was, you know, working for 200,000 personnel. She is also on the board. Besides that, as all of you know, in the public sector, oil and gas enterprises, they are the topmost enterprise. And we have Oil and Natural Gas Commission. Their chairperson is in the board of the institute. Then, mineral enterprises are very important, like South Africa. I have been to Northwest province of South Africa. I stayed there for three months. And uh, we developed there together what is known as rural development policy under the R&D program, construction program. And uh, there we developed a raft of rural development institutions. And uh, as a pilot project that was implemented in two provinces of South Africa, and then from two provinces it went to other 15 provinces of South Africa. And I have done some paper on that. I'll circulate that paper uh, based on you know, our interaction in different states you know, of uh, South Africa. Uh, Free state, and we had we been to you know different kind of states over there. Of course, Northwest. I was there for very long, and the Northwest. Uh, what you see there, minerals very closely. That kind of work is done by National Mineral Development Corporation here in India. But I always say, our NMDC, that if you want to do better, go to South Africa. Let's see how they do it in the Northwest province where you have all kinds of top minerals of the world in that province and the best kind of methods of extraction which are neither no, not heard and even not seen and even not implemented. So uh, uh, we do that. So we have been doing all these things and now uh, as you would see we have you know a faculty strength of about 60 colleagues. They are full-time faculty members in different areas like sociology, political science, anthropology, management, commerce, uh, languages, foreign affairs, diplomacy, you think of anything, management, all of them, they are here. We have a board, uh, which is very, very eminent, I told you. And also, uh, we have access to about 100 adjunct faculty members who come from public policy, civil service, topmost universities, topmost labs in Hyderabad. They all are attached. So always we can go to them and always they can you know, come and they can, uh, they can help us. Uh, I think we'll talk more about that later, but meanwhile some more colleagues have come. Here they have joined us and there we have Mosmi Chatterjee. Uh, Dr. Mosmi, Dr. Mosmi, uh, yeah. uh, Mosmi Chatterjee was a great, you know, uh, great actress, film actress. So I always, when you say Mosmi, you know, I remember. Uh, Mosmi. Uh, Mosmi is doing her PhD with one of the topmost technology institutes like in the US. You have MIT's. Uh, we borrowed that pattern from US and India and we also set up Indian Institutes of Technology. She is doing her PhD over there and next to that is Professor Raj. Uh, Dr. Raj is uh, an MA in Political Science and Public Administration. He has worked in Indian Police Academy. He has worked here. He has worked in a financial institution. He's an excellent uh, trainer. He has done a lot of case work with Dr. Shulugna Sarkar. We have a case center over here and he publishes uh, many things. And Dr. Geeta, Dr. Sridhar Raj and Dr. Kiran, they are part of a trilateral dialogue between India, Nepal and Bangladesh. And uh, we, uh, three institutions are promoting policy related studies 
and those studies will be converted into cases and also training program for the top personnel of these uh, these uh, no, three countries. So there come. Let me once again we have Dr. Shikant. He is head of our research. Uh, we have a research division here, as I just told you. Uh, we have our PhD program. Uh, we have you know commission research. We do many research on our own. Uh, we publish our annual report by way of corporate governance. And he's the person who liaises between all you know, research institutions and IP. We have been accredited as PhD center by 10 universities in India. And next to her, uh, him is Dr. Usha here. She's an expert in the area of trade. And she does work on trade treaties, trade you know, tariffs, uh, regional trading blocks, and international finance. Uh, am I right? I think you know, these kind of things we have been doing very difficult to understand trade. Uh, but uh, now we have a very, very good colleague over there. So friends, uh, I think, you know, uh, the time for wait has come to an end. The president who will inaugurate has already come. And she tells me that you have no business to speak any uh, further than this. Thank you, sir. Uh, dear participants, my faculty colleagues and officers from IP, it is indeed a great moment for all of us. We have in our midst a top administrator, a top thinker, and a top human being who is our president, Sri K. Madhav Rao Garu. So please join me in welcoming him and giving him the <laughs> Shri K. Madhara Garu is our president of the institute and chairman of its executive committee. He has been with the institute for the last uh, 35 years and more. And if today institute is at this juncture, it is all because of his leadership, his interest in the institute, and the time and effort that he makes for us to move forward. Entire faculty of the institute and staff is extremely grateful to him for that. And you can understand his interest in the institute. It is a state holiday today a very important holiday for the state. But our president has been gracious, very gracious, in accepting our request of coming over here and blessing, blessing all of us. You wanted me to, to, to tell something about uh, our president. He's the president, board of governors, joined the top civil service of our country in 62 and uh, since then he rose to the position of the chief secretary of the composite state he was advisor to the government of bihar he was also the chairman of high power committee for urban cooperative banks in 1999 he was a director of the central board of the topmost bank of our country of the reserve bank of india and a member of the board for financial supervision of RBI from 2000 to 2006. Between 1979 and 1997, he was the secretary for various departments. That will be of interest to you because you come from different departments, including general administration, panchayat raj, rural development, food and agriculture, irrigation, and special secretary, special chief secretary of finance department of government and Andhra Pradesh. Uh, he also heads uh, many uh, social organizations like uh, AP Mass. He's adding that. Uh, he's known for uh, the work that he has done over the last uh, 35 years. Uh, I don't think anybody can talk better than him about Indian administration. What it is, how does it function, where we are, where we have to go, what are the challenges? Because India administration, Indian governance, what are the challenges? 
And I think that will be of interest not only to uh, faculty, but to all of you. But uh, before I do that, I would request all my, you know, all, all my colleagues and uh, our, uh, our you know, uh, participants to introduce themselves. I think very quickly. Then we'll have a talk. My name is Ababur Mohamed. I'm from Nigeria. I work with the Bureau of Public Enterprises. It's an, agency, it's an agency, government agency, that is charged with the responsibility of reform and privatization of the state of enterprises in Nigeria. Thank you very much. I'm Shakirat Ememu Yelike from Bureau of Public Enterprises. I'm in charge of the reform on telecom sector in the Bureau of Public Enterprises. My name is um, Amina Tukur Othman. I work with the Bureau of Public Enterprises, the Nigerian Privatization Agency. Good morning. My name is Patrick Sechuala. I'm the manager in charge of collections at Uganda Revenue Authority, Uganda. Good morning. <coughs> My name is Suleiman Mohamed Amis. I'm coming from Tanzania. I work with Minister of Finance in the Department of Revenue and Collection. Good morning. My name is Gabriel Gabramedan. I am from Ethiopia, Vice President for Ethiopian Civil Service University. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Ayahaya Galwa. I'm handling the privatization of the coal unit of the Bureau of Public Enterprises in Nigeria. Oh, most of them public enterprises. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Tina Kaidu. I'm in charge of research and revenue modeling in the Re Uganda Revenue Authority. Uh, I feel uh, nice to meet you all, and uh, I look forward to interacting with all of you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Trol Kapada. I came from Ethiopia, human resource uh, expert. I like I, all of you Indian people. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Daniel Lirebo. Um, my profession is um, uh, urban planning and design. At, uh, I think a, a bit different from other professions. And then uh, uh, came from Ethiopia, uh, from Ethiopian Civil Service University, and I'm Dean of College of Urban Development and Engineering. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Ian Yona. Uh, I work with Malawi Energy Regulator Authority, uh, which is a government agency that regulates uh, fuels, uh, gas, and electricity. I work as an internal audit manager. Good morning, everybody. My name is Eze Kalistos. I work with the Bureau of Public Enterprises, Nigeria. My department is uh, the department in charge of privatization of industry and services in the Nigerian government. Thank you. Happy to meet you. An acquaintance with people like you as a participant here. Back in 1983, I went for a six-week course in the International Monetary Fund. And uh, we had about ten uh, friends from uh, the... Uh, the African uh, continent. So it's now, it's a, now it's a little more than that number now. I'm happy to see uh, you participating in this um, first international uh, course we are organizing here. So you would be in that sense, doing a great honor to, the, to, the, to this institute as being the uh, first batch of participants, I would uh, expect that many, many more such courses would um, be followed after this. Uh, Dr. Mishra said I should talk about governance. So I said, okay, governance probably is something which I can uh, uh, talk about. But uh, <clears throat> then they have added a tale saying the challenges in India. 
It's not as a governance challenge is only for India. You have challenges all over the world, literally every country, including the top three countries, America, Russia, and um, China. So I would rather prefer that we start with uh, a global uh, situation. And before that, since uh, obviously most of you are in public enterprises, not so much with uh, the history, polity, and philosophy, maybe a few words about what is governance? When did it come into being? The word may be later, but governance is something connected with people organizing themselves, living together, not fighting, but living together. So, when did it start? Now, like, uh, you, if I look back, probably it started about 2,000 years back. when they came and started living together in a small group. Why do people have to live together? Before that it was the animal world. We have a world out of the animal world. I am one of those who believe in Darwin that we have all out of animals, not created by God. But most of you, I'm sure, 90% of the world, are, uh, its number is increasing. Uh, the number of non-believers like me is increasing happily for me. The people who think that we are created by God. But uh, the science tells us it is an evolution. That's what uh, Darwin talked about. We evolved from the single cell of a fish to what we are looking like today. Now, in this process, obviously, in the animal world, in the, there, was no, there can be no governance. It's free for all. A lion will uh, kill a lamb and eat it for survival. An elephant will eat grass, but grass also is something alive, it's not dead heart kill. So there is a kind of destruction of species one by the other for sustenance. A lion cannot live without eating another animal. Similarly, a an elephant or a giraffe. Nobody was regulating them, saying that you should not kill, and so forth. But in the case of the carnivores, they had a kind of packs, a pack of lions, a pack of wolves, from that, when we evolved, obviously the numbers were very few. The first human being came and then a two, three, four, like that. So they had to live on the fruits, roots, and hunting animals. Now these animals some of them are wild, ferocious, they could have killed the man himself. So they were taking shelter in a cave, and that's where the caveman's culture started, this is about 2000 years ago. Now when they have to go out for hunting, how do they do? They do? Will they go alone? If they go alone, they are not sure they will come back in the evening. So they have to go in a group. When they go in a group, they have to decide whether after leaving the cave they, they go to the right or left, east or west, 
and which animal will this hunt for the day for that they need a leader so that's where the government started with ten of us assuming that we have started in a cave went out for hunting one of us has to be leader and those days obviously initially the strongest man was the leader but over a period of time it's not just the strongest man he must see that all the ten are organized so that they don't dispute among themselves so you have to have some kind of leadership qualities it's not physical strength alone now this leadership was obviously elected are chosen that's where the governance started that leader tells will go this way will hunt this animal today or gather these fruits today now uh, how does that happen as i said from physical strength to leadership qualities judgment now this man selection is what is now called a social contract these ten people they have agreed to make him a leader who will lead them in their sustenance the origin of social contracts to me starts with the caveman society now after this when the numbers increased there are some other caves where other groups lived there was competition between these peoples so they have to have some kind of getting together or eliminating each other so the ten man cave group became bigger and you have a big tribal chief taking over other areas then it went into bigger areas bigger areas you have the villages then the civilization came agriculture so the governance started increasing in terms of numbers instead of 10 maybe 15 it has gone to now a few crores of people all over the world so from the tribal chief you have a small province then a country then they colonized great examples are america and africa india in all this you have that governance system this is what people like russo called lock called social contract now the governance is nothing but a social contract of the people organizing themselves living together surviving progressing with an understanding that they will act together and since they can't all act together independently they have to have a representative they have to have to have a leader then came from small principalities to countries and even among countries obviously you need some coexistence so you have united nations thanks to the world war which gave the need for the countries themselves acting together in a manner that they don't destroy each other now you have within that social contract governance theory you have monarchies you have diarchies you have dictatorship you have democracies and in the democracies limited democracies you have presidential system you have parliamentary system so on there are variations but at the basis is the issue of governance now there are people who have 
thought about this governance, wrote about this governance, and when they looked into the way it should be organized, obviously they have to see the nature of the human being. And the first man who said in a very, very strong expression, Hobbes, he said, man is essentially selfish, brutish, and short. The animal is selfish. We have evolved out of the animal, so we are selfish. Now, if you are selfish, one man's self clashes with the self of the other man. One group's self clashes this with the self of the other group. So you have to have some governance system, and this that system came with the social contract. We agree that he will be the leader of 12 of us. Till we find he is so unfit, we will say, no, 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 he is not the leader. She is the leader. This is how it started. And today, in the most evolved system of governance, which is supposed to be democracy, how does this social contract take place? We have elections. Some, some places it's four years, some places it's five years in India. In India we have elections every five years. Now the elections are the social contract. In the election, the people elect representatives for an area. Those representatives constitute a legislature of a state or a province in your area, you call it probably province or state, what do you call it? Units of a country, we call it states here. And at a higher level you have the legislature for the entire country, the parliament. So every five years we renew that social contract by electing the representatives who have to govern us on behalf of us. But the basic understanding behind the social contract is that the people whom we elect or the king whom we accept rules for the benefit of all. But obviously if man is selfish, how does he rule for the benefit of all? Then you have the concept of social good, you have the concept of individual will and the general will. People like Hegel, again Hobbes, Locke and Rousseau, they talked about this. And the great philosopher Bentham, gave this slogan, what is the job of a ruler, whether it is the king or today whether it is the president in a presidential system or the prime minister and his cabinet, what is their brief? Their brief, according to Bentham, maximize the good of maximum number of people. Maximize the good of maximum number of people. Now that is the principle of governance. That is the basis for social contract. Now if their job is to maximize the good of maximum number of people, is it happening? If it is not happening, who is failing? Now, we'll here take the case of uh, India. We have a full democracy where every citizen above certain age is eligible to vote and above certain age is eligible to contest to be elected as a representative of the people. 
when they get their five-year term, before the election, they make some kind of assurances that we propose to serve the, human, the society for good of maximum number of people. And we have a constitution, a number of other countries have a constitution. Unlike other countries, our constitution has a preamble which says, because we got it, got back our independence from the British Raj, the power is transferred from the British to Indians. And the preamble says greatly, we the people of India give this country to ourselves to establish a system where there is equality, liberty, fraternity and particularly in India, whose this provision is made, the state shall endeavor to reduce inequalities, concentration of wealth, and make the resources of the state and opportunities available to all the people. So the principle of equality is the same as maximizing the good of maximum number of people. Not many constitutions would say that the governance principle is to reduce inequalities, but we have said that. Re remove the existing inequalities. By the time we had constitution and independence, there were inequalities. The framers of the constitution said we will reduce the inequalities and we will not allow concentration of power, wealth and access to the opportunities and resources. If you look back from that noble principle of equality Where did we land today? We went exactly in the opposite direction. The concentration of wealth has increased. The number of people who are rich have become more. And the poor are becoming poorer, the rich are becoming richer. Now, how is it happening? It's happening because of the human nature. Man is selfish. And that's where Marx and Angels enter. How does one man become rich and another man become poor? It is the exploitation of a man's participation in production by one person or a group of persons of denying the share of other people. So this exploitation is resulting in inequality. Now if you leave these matters to the individuals themselves, this is bound to continue. So the country has decided that it will reduce inequalities, it will not allow concentration of wealth. And if instead of that we have uh, increase the number of rich people, made people poorer, obviously it is the failure of governance. It is said that India, which has a constitution to say that there should be 
reduction of inequalities is a third country in terms of number of billionaires we should be the last if we follow the constitution so there is a failure of governance and we have an opportunity to change the representatives or the rulers every five years and since 1947 we had number of elections but obviously the position has worsened so who are to be blamed is it the voter the citizen who voted people to power who are allowing these inequalities to increase or is it the ruler now this is something which i would like you to answer in self my answer it's not as though this inequality is unique to india but this wonderful country says we will reduce inequalities america doesn't say that the western countries most of them do not say that i don't know your countries whether your constitution says that but we have said that we solemnly undertake to do this so the challenge is the failure of governance and the governance is in terms of three organs of the state legislature executive and the judiciary one is supposed to be check on the other the executive is supposed to do the actual governance as per legislation passed by the parliament has to deliver this good governance and if it doesn't do that the legislation must con- legislature must control if both of them fail the legis- the judiciary must come as a check this is called the checks and balances your checks and balances in other countries also but uh, these checks and balances have have they increased or decreased now uh, what a good government can do we can see by a few examples singapore a city state got independence more or less around the same time as india got independence lee kuan yew is the prime minister who has been the prime minister for a number of years more than 30 years and in terms of the standards of governance everybody talks about singapore did one man make the difference obviously he has contributed much more than anybody else but because of his own example person example and value system singapore is what it is today being held as a kind of icon example to other countries there are some countries which have degenerated become uh, dictatorships the dictator amassed wealth at the expense of the poor people and when there was resistance they were killed en masse you are all aware of that the thinking that came up particularly in india and it so with most of the western democracies if all the three organs of the state the legislature executive and judiciary fail what is the solution now the solution came in, in terms of what is called the fourth estate the media the media represents 
the dissatisfaction, the misery of the people, and challenges the state organs. He did a good job for a long, long time. But in India, so is the case with most of the other countries. The media also was captured by the rich people. Now here come the issue, what is the relationship between industry, business and government? Interestingly, it's not as though today the businessmen of India have captured the government for the first time. The businessmen prospering with the help of government has been again as old as the Crusades, as old as the voyages. It is the business. It's the businessmen who have financed the voyages so that he could go on and discover America and occupy that land. He could go discover India, occupy it, make it as your colony. And he was even financing wars. When you get financed by the businessmen. When you come to power, obviously you're obliged to him. So there is a nefarious relationship between business and the governance. To the extent we can control this relationship, we have that Bentham principle of maximizing good of maximum number of people. We have cases where the bank finance, which we take as a loan for putting up an industry, small or big, comes from a bank, which is the people's savings deposited in the bank. It's a resource. The banks are licensed by the government. So it's in that sense a public institution. Is the bank giving loans to the people in a fair manner? We, you would you have heard some of you, Reliance is one of the, why, why, it is, a rich, it is the biggest industrial house in India. That house alone has taken a loan of one lakh crore rupees from the bank. Now, if the resources have to be distributed to all, how can one person take or one family take uh, one lakh crores of rupees? There is another group called Adani, he also takes one lakh crores of rupees. Now, after taking the loan, are they all paying back the loans? You have what we call the non-performing assets where they do not pay the bank and banks get into trouble. And when banks get into trouble, the government goes to their rescue by giving the taxpayers money. Famous example is that 2007-2008 uh, uh, collapse. Now, the industrialist finances the politician and the politician obliges the industrialist to prosper. Now, this is the failure of governance. Is there uh, no hope? There is an interesting example of a country called Georgia. It's one of those uh, countries which was part of the larger USSR but later became independent. It was uh, known for its total failure of governance. 
it, it is said that if ever you went out of your house on a bicycle or a car, you can never come back home without paying a bribe to the policeman who is on the traffic duty. Nobody can ever come back home without paying a bribe. And they said, the people who are doing all this exploitation, whether it is in government service or in industry, had such criminal background, the government employees also started adopting their practices. And the report says, the report is not by somebody who is uh, a pessimist, but the World Bank. I just, this is a study made by the World Bank in 2010 of Georgia. And the heading is interestingly, fighting corruption in public services. It is this which report says, it is difficult to distinguish between a criminal and an official. The biggest house belonged to the official. The, rich, the costliest car belonged to the official. How did he become like that? Most, some of you are in government service. Our salaries are not such whether we, where we can afford the, the costliest car and the biggest house. So obviously they made money through corruption. So it was going on like that and in 2010 there was a new, a new parliament was elected. The entire populace of the country were so fed up with the corruption, with the crime, that they went with a rose in their hand to the newly elected parliament house and they said, we have come here to give you this rose and congratulate you for being elected as the new members of the parliament. You know what's happening in India, happening in this country, the corruption, the crime. We hope during your tenure, things will improve. And they quietly gave a message so that they are not stopped from talking to them. We brought you roses, we are leaving now, but if things don't improve, we will not bring roses, we will, be, we will bring something else. Obviously, they were talking about taking a guns or uh, stones. Surprisingly, In 10 years, this country was recognized by the Transparency International as the country which was, is number one in reducing corruption in public services. And only 3% people said that we gave bribes in the entire country for that year. Now, this is one of those silent revolutions. You had bloody revolution starting with the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, Chinese Revolution. But you also have this kind of examples where you, the people, instead of saying we the people, you the people, you the people also have an opportunity to change this governance system. And the best example is Georgia. We have similar examples elsewhere. In India also we have those examples where a group of people calling themselves as a kind of activists change the loss of elections to an extent where 
things have vastly improved. Now, earlier we have what is called the secret, oath of secrecy, that's what we inherited from the British system. As an officer, when you take office, as a parliament member, when you take office, you'll say that, I swear that I will not reveal the secrets that have come to my notice during my handling of the affairs of the state. If you are serving the people, there should be no secret. But we have Secrecy Act. It was necessary during the British rule, but is it necessary in a democracy? But certain things we continued to the measure of the people. And uh, a group of activists went to the Supreme Court and said this act is against the interests of the public. And so we have what is called the Right to Information Act. We can ask an officer, what is the decision in this case? You can ask a minister, what is the decision you have taken? Then a similar example came with uh, the ADR, Association for Democratic Rights. I was associated with in a manner after uh, my retirement. Three professors from IAM Ahmedabad. They were uh, teaching in that university, uh, institute rather. One evening, they were getting depressed over a cup of tea. The country is so, such a bad failure. What's the solution? And they said, there is no point in complaining. Let us think positively and say, what is it we can do? They started that association called the Association for Democratic Rights. They are the people who are responsible for bringing a number of improvements in the election laws. People would spend much more than what is authorized by the election law in the elections. So these people said they must declare their expenditure. They went to the court and the Supreme Court said yes. They must declare what are the assets they have at the time of election. And what's the expenditure they have incurred? Is it within the limits prescribed by law? Has it increased? I wouldn't say that everybody is spending within the means, within the limits, but this kind of gradual activist reforms are what is possible. Now, obviously, we have traveled too far in terms of time and maybe civilization that we won't go back to Bastille's days and then have a revolution. But say that we can do things in a more gentlemanly way. You do this, you take this rules, you do this, otherwise we'll have to come back with something else. Uh, this is, is this really the only solution? Is it solving the entire problem? No. But you have to make a choice. You take to violence or you take to civil society activity. This is a challenge not just confined to India, but in the whole state. Now, you are seeing today in America what's happening. It's full of Trump. It's full of Trump. A society which had such wonderful record, 
here I must say that each a number of countries, I would say every country, number of country, countries had what are called the founding fathers. Lee Kuan Yew, Singapore, Sun Yat Sen for China, Garbaldi, Nelson Mandela for your own area. And for India, we have people like Nehru, Gandhi, Patel. For America, you had those three people, Washington, Jefferson, Mad Madison. The founding fathers had a long vision. They had a great vision. They had an ethical vision. But compared to what those three people are, where did la America land today? It landed in the hands of Trump. So the journey obviously is not smooth, it's not uniform, it's not always progressive. You have ups and downs, maybe Trump will get impeached, maybe he will be defeated, maybe he will be thrown out. But there will be retribution and there has to be retribution. Yeah, uh, so when you say the challenges are governance, I, I, I thought I will run you through my idea of a caveman to this group of participants and uh, faculty where uh, we, are, we are all part of governance we have responsibility not only as a teacher to teach, but as a citizen to participate. And we have to improve our own lot. The ruler may not be interested in improving our lot. We have to improve our own lot. And that is the basic responsibility and the basic guarantee for a good governance. So there I stop. Thank you. Thank you.